Have you ever noticed those catwalks inside the Lincoln and Holland tunnels? Well, believe it or not, when these tunnels first opened, the little catwalks were used by police to patrol traffic. However, given the discrepancy in speed between a walking officer and a moving car, a new solution was needed. And in 1954, the Port Authority Police Department had an answer. They installed tiny electric bi-directional cars to whisk the cops back and forth at a whopping 12 miles per hour. This is the story of New York's forgotten tunnel police car. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The rise of the automobile changed many things about the way people traveled to and around Manhattan, requiring a small army of police to hold order in the city. Still, given the fact that with tunnels, people could now cross independently, the city's landscape and architecture was forever altered. But the story actually goes back much further than that. Let's start off by acknowledging the fact that, historically speaking, crossings were always done in groups, which limited the total number of vehicles needed to be stored and policed. In fact, the only other time when people crossed in their own craft was when the tribal people accessed the land via canoes, or when the Dutch settlers came over in their wagons. But even when the 17th century Dutch settlers developed and expanded roads for horse-drawn carriages, they ultimately relied on ferries to cross the water gap, as the other way would have been a long way around. Meaning, there was still serious friction in the number of vehicles that could be brought onto the island from the west. Even so, there did come a time when their numbers were so massive that it influenced the city's layout. In a way, bringing forward the groundwork for a city of cars. Streets had to be wider. The ground floors of buildings were altered to accommodate loading and unloading of goods from wagons, leading to loading docks and alleys in some cases. Warehouse design was also enhanced to handle a better flow of goods, including multi-story facilities with hoist, elevators, and even internal circulation systems. Pedestrian traffic was also an issue here, as now cities needed to designate space for people walking by installing curbs and sidewalks. There was also the concept of traffic control, ensuring that wagons were parked in designated areas and didn't disturb the peace by unloading throughout the night. To enforce this order, the city created an ordinance pertaining to horse-drawn wagons. And it's rather remarkable because if you exchange the word wagon for car, these rules will sound very familiar. Section 1. Definitions. Horse-drawn wagons refers to any vehicle drawn by one or more horses used for transportation of goods or passengers. Section 2. Designated wagon routes. All horse-drawn wagons engaged in commercial activities shall follow the designated routes specified by the Department of Transportation. These routes shall be established to minimize congestion and ensure the safe and efficient flow of traffic. Section 3. Loading and Unloading Zones Commercial horse-drawn wagons may load or unload goods within the designated loading and unloading zones as indicated by signage. Loading and unloading activities shall not obstruct traffic or impede pedestrian movement. Section 4. Hours of operation, loading and unloading activities by horse-drawn wagons shall be restricted to certain hours of the day, typically during off-peak traffic periods. The Department of Transportation shall determine the specific hours of operation. Section 5. Staging Areas Staging areas for horse-drawn wagons awaiting loading or assignments shall be designated by the Department of Transportation. Wagon operators shall not stage their vehicles on public streets, obstructing traffic or pedestrian access. Section 6. License and Registration all horse-drawn wagon operators engaged in commercial activities within the city shall obtain a valid license and registration from the city's licensing authority. These licenses shall be prominently displayed on the wagon. Section 7. Prohibited activities. It shall be unlawful for horse-drawn wagons to engage in any of the following activities. Obstructing intersections, crosswalks or fire hydrants, operating in a reckless or unsafe manner, parking or staging in unauthorized areas, overloading beyond the vehicle's designated capacity. 
By the 19th century, with the onset of industrialization, it seemed like individual vehicles wouldn't necessarily congest the city the same way that wagons did. The quantity just wasn't there yet. Additionally, trains enabled the masses to access the city from regional destinations. At the same time, a new subway system introduced commuting and urban sprawl. So it seemed that these technologies would be paramount. But it needs to be emphasized that aside from the actual smoke of steam trains, this option seemed like a great deal. Trains could move massive amounts of goods and people, but were limited to either a large detour or a rail float, so they couldn't rapidly overcrowd the city or congest the streets. Even if many lines actually ran at street level, the wagons were easy to store in designated places like the West Side Rail Yard. And although trains had their own legal ordinance and enforcement, everything was designated to a professional industry and specific spaces, so it was rather easy to supervise. In other words, trains were and are probably what's best for New York, but when the automobile came into the picture, none of that would matter much longer. Although early automobiles were seen as a novelty, it didn't take long for their presence to raise questions about road infrastructure and traffic regulations. By the 20th century, everything changed. Roads were expanded to include multiple lanes, gas stations, driveways, and parking lots appeared, with some buildings even having their own parking garage. But the downsides were serious. Beyond the obvious pollution issue, the city's bridges were clogged. For example, the Brooklyn Bridge was initially designed and completed in 1883 as a hybrid suspension bridge intended for passing pedestrians, horse-drawn vehicles, and elevated trains. However, as automobile use became more widespread in the early 20th century, modifications were made to the bridge to accommodate cars. As a side effect of this, some of the bridge's rail tracks were removed to make way for cars, and additional entrance ramps were set up. In fact, for those of you who've been subscribed to the channel for a while, you might recall our video about the world building, which was demolished exactly for this purpose. Anyhow, cars were putting too much pressure on New York's infrastructure, and hence tunnels were built. The construction of the Holland and Lincoln tunnels didn't really help the congestion situation. In fact, it probably made matters much worse. While the city enjoyed improved commerce and trade, it was as if no one really foresaw how to manage the traffic flow and congestion around the tunnel's entrances and exits. To be fair, the tunnels were built in the 1920s and 30s, at a time when automobiles were popular, but city officials probably couldn't really imagine the pure surge of popularity that would come post-World War II when basically everyone bought a car. This sudden and massive increase in traffic meant that the tunnels required significant planning and coordination to prevent bottlenecks and ensure smooth transit for both locals and through traffic. One of the ways officials managed their strategy was with foot patrol officers equipped to recognize the early warning signs of a traffic jam and alleviate them as soon as possible. When the foot units would notice an inconsistent traffic flow, a sudden decrease in speed and lots of red brake lights within the tunnel, they would travel on foot via the 2.5 foot wide catwalk to find the source of the problem. Their solutions may have been very simple, such as directing drivers around a stalled vehicle or assisting in a difficult merge. However, with each tunnel being over a mile and a half long, this type of supervision would require several police officers. So in 1954, the Port Authority PD ran a test in the Holland Tunnel by installing a specifically made fixed vehicle to a track line running the entire length of the tunnel. The vehicle ran on a three horsepower electric motor, moving the officers at 12 miles per hour in either direction. This new concept enabled swift responses to any issues and helped the city budget by reducing the number of officers needed down to just four. The test was a success, and by 1960, the Lincoln Tunnel was added to the program with a second generation model, featuring an almost aerospace-like design. These new cars had eight horsepower gas engines and could reach a top speed of 35 miles per hour. These catwalk cars played their role until the year 2011, when cameras, signage, and computer enforcement replaced them. That's right, modern technology had finally caught up with the tunnel and the foot patrols. Before wrapping up here, I do have to acknowledge one somewhat sensitive observation. Referring back to this image of an officer sitting inside the catwalk car back in the 1960s, he looks rather cramped. 
The catwalk itself is only 2.5 feet wide, and from the photograph, we can estimate that around half a foot of the platform ledge is not covered by the vehicle. The edge of the car itself also takes up space, leaving an incredibly small area for a full-grown man to fit. And if the average shoulder width of an adult male is only about 1.8 feet wide, then this would be a very tight squeeze. Now I want you to imagine a modern physique and ask yourself if these small cars became unusable because they could no longer accommodate most police officers. I'd love to hear your answer to that question in the comment section, and a special thanks to the subscriber who recommended this topic to me on Instagram. If you have ideas for an episode you'd like to see, please feel free to reach out to me as well, and we'll see about making it. Anyways, until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.